And so that's the hardest change to make. Thank you, Keith. Some challenges and some solutions coming there. There was a. Does anybody else on the panel want to pick up on Lynn's question? This one, Damien, and then. Uh, yeah, I'm just wondering. You know, there's, there's a lot of money being spent with in the region uh, at the moment on various uh, water resource development proposals, um, with different money allocated to different proponents. And Townsland Prize are doing one. Is it Bowen Collinsville equivalent are doing another? And up so and so and so up the coast. Um, so these are all essentially local organisations. So I think part of what you were talking there is a, a, co a coordination between all these different proposals and a consistency in approach. Um, so I think in this case, there are local organisations that I would have hoped would have got together to do, and I think that's one of the things we're talking about today, is, is there are all these different proposals and how are we looking at the whole big picture together rather than each individual proposal almost competing against the other. So, and that's actually a local thing, it seems to me, given the money's been awarded to local organisations. So why can't the regional players come together and create a, a coordinated approach using that money or part of that money um, to produce a coordinated plan for the verdict and for a start? So I don't, this is something that we ought to fix amongst our local officials and um, yeah. And I might add on that one, while I'm at it, that there's a lot, of, a lot of money in these proposals. I mean, this feasibility study is $24 million each. I just feel we're not learning a lot out of it. And I've seen this happen. I've been involved in a lot of DEM EISs and the equivalent over the 20 odd years. And we don't learn much out of any of them. They, they spend a lot of money regurgitating things we already know. When the, <laughs> when the opportunity is there to actually learn new information from those studies, they, they, they're quite generic. So I think, and I think you're talking about that, if we want to make these decisions sensible decisions, we need to have more information. And we have a lot of money, a lot of proposals going on, and we're not learning enough information and new knowledge that we can share amongst ourselves um, for the amount of money and amount of feasibility study that's going on at the moment. There's a real opportunity being lost that we're not collecting that information and not having a whole of catchment discussions. So, and I think that's kind of up to us to fix it, actually. This is a, a local issue. There's nothing we can blame the federal government on, I don't think. Thanks, Damien, for highlighting that and also suggesting a solution. You have a question? Uh, Peter McCallum from Mackay Conservation Group, and thanks, Damien, for answering my question. Uh, I was interested in that whole cumulative um, issue of multiple dam projects. But uh, another question I had was, um, is anyone looking at the outcomes uh, of climate change on these uh, proposals in the Vertican or what the, the future would look like for the Vertican under a climate chaos or that we may see in the future? Would like to pick that one up. Yeah. Um, specifically, with, uh, water resource development. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we we lacking yeah. a, a a body, a leader, a you know, a, a, an activity, um, and it's it's kind of crazy, and we know that uh, you know climate change is real, and but we don't seem to be doing anything. Surely they are in the, in the feasibility study. Surely they're doing that. Sure. Yeah. Um, not, I can't come. I'm not aware of what they're doing, but surely. <laughs> question from Vern Beach just there, and then a question from this gentleman over here. Yeah, thank you, Vern Beach. Uh, I'm the chair of the Local Marine Advisory Committee, and you probably many of you know that I've been involved in this sort of stuff for a long time and worked for Damien for a little while. Um, my first question, and I'll let others have a go before I ask a second. But uh, my first question is about the management, uh, particularly in low flow years. Obviously, the uh, uh, Hell's Gate Dam uh, is upstream of the Burdekin Dam. It is the most reliable arm of the Burdekin River. It flows into the Burdekin Dam. In a low flow year, the Burdekin Dam doesn't overtop. It uh, often stays well below uh, full capacity level, 50, 60% in a low flow year. The Burdekin Dam is the, not only a critical resource for the Lower Burdekin, which is an established agricultural area, but it's also the uh, now the backup water for the city of Townsville. So who gets what if the um, if the Hell's Gate Dam does go ahead? Uh, how, how can if we build a dam? How can we then deny water to the farmers that are uh, farming on that 30 to 50 thousand hectares and have spent all of that money and need the turnover? But how do we then supply water to the farmers in the Lower Burdekin and to the city of Townsville? 
any of the panel want to uh, comment in response to Fern's challenging questions? I'd, I'd, I'd just say that Fern's yeah. question is a political question. And I think that's one of the reasons why we're really feeling within NQCC that there needs to be a whole of catchment um, yeah. consideration here. The piecemeal kind of development that's been proposed recently is a nonsense in terms of the existing situation. So it needs a whole of catchment integrated planning and management. Um, gentlemen in the blue shirt. Uh, hi there, I'm Chris Hopper. Um, helped John Connell out with some drone footage and also the mapping for Eric as well. Um, I've got two questions. Um, first one, uh, if Damien, probably both targeted at Damien, sadly. Um, First one is like we're really focused on um, all this farming in the area, okay? We've forgot a whole industry, okay? Um, and that's seafood, okay? Um, every common fisherman in, a, in Point North Queensland likes to catch barramundi. Um, we also like prawns. Um, how much of the seafood that's seen on your plate is spawned in um, Bowling Green Bay? So. Um, I've read some reports and stuff, but I'm not sure. So I just wanted to clear that up. That what how significant is Bowling Green Bay to seafood in the area? Say if I go into MQ Marina tomorrow. I honestly, I don't know. know actually, you don't know. <laughs> That's a, a very specific question that would um, require more of a, a knowledge of the industry. Be, I think it's best to uh, actually a seafood industry person or a fit, like regional fisherman would have the answer to that better than a scientist. Um, cool. But but I'll, I'll, I'll just say, look, it's a good point. Um, there's no doubt that the, the fisheries is very, like, as I said, very dependent on flow and it's been already been probably affected by the development to date anyway. Uh, but how much of it is specific in a question like that? Yeah, that's fine. Um, now, our second question would be, um, obviously, we know there's erosion of uh, Cape Bowling Green. Um, my projections state that, well, they're around uh, mangrove erosion of 10 metres per year. So, um, with the one section of the Cape being 540 metres, you can do quick maths on that. Um, now, um, we've got a section of the Cape that's five hectares uh, in the centre. Um, now, how would uh, we work around um, rehabilitating the area, considering that um, irrigation of the area would be difficult, um, with a survival rate of 1% on rehabilitation of mangroves? So, um, that, that was from a national parks ranger. He said survival rate of, of 1% of mangroves, if, like, of when they've rehabilit done rehabilitation. So, have you got any? ideas on how we could work around that? Well, I'll just... Um, when we do mangrove rehabilitation, we don't actually try not to patch a plant plants. It's not traditional like a terrestrial where you go and plant a thousand trees. Yep. Uh, mangroves will grow if the hydraulic conditions are right for them. So the question, the, the method is to create the right hydraulic conditions for the plants that are dispersed on seawater anyway, their seeds float. And they will, Mother Nature will take care of it if you provide the right hydraulic conditions for those mangroves. Uh, so, in a lot of cases where, where they're restoring mangroves, they're actually pushing a bit of sand around basically to get the right tidal height and the right conditions and letting the mangroves colonise themselves. And if you get the right conditions, the survival rate's very high. Okay. Um, so, if, but if you plant, yes, you get very low conditions because if, if the conditions are already right for the mangroves to grow, they would have grown there already. So, you know, and if, if you're planting them, you're planting them in a place where they've already told you they don't want to be. And that's why people who plant mangroves end up with 1% success rate, because the mangroves are really telling you that we don't want to be there. If we do, we would have... They're very good colonisers, mangroves. They're very good at colonising available, suitable space. Uh, and their seeds will float on the ocean for months until they find the right spot. So let them tell you. So that's, 
Yeah, so the 1% is true, but that's not the way you should do it. So we create the right conditions, and that will require a bit of a specific examination of where you want to plant and what the currents are doing. But Scott might want to have something to say on Cape Bowling Green. Yeah, yeah thanks. Um, look, Cape Bowling Green is, is an interesting one, and it's, it's obviously um, a very important physical feature. It's uh, obviously doing a whole lot of uh, very important ecosystem service provision uh, um, yeah, jobs, for want of a better term, for a whole range of different other parts of the ecosystem and economies. I think one of the things about the whole of the Burdekin and Cape Bowling Green to keep in mind is that it is actually a very dynamic system naturally and we have done a lot of things to um, intervene in that natural variability and I think a lot of people don't really understand how young some parts of that system are and how, you know, that, how that system has developed over the past few thousand years and what the legacy of that is for some of the features that we're interested in. So to give you an example, um, Kangala, the sand that's on the beach of Kangala, was put there by the Burdekin when the Burdekin, you know, six or so thousand years ago, a bit earlier than that, discharged into that area before it actually then bounced around in various locations to build up the delta. And at the base of Cape Bowling Green, it basically was discharging out in roughly that area from about, you know, five and a half thousand through to maybe four and a half or four thousand years ago. So there was a big lump of sand put right there by an earlier course of the Burdekin that has, you know, been redistributed north, like all the other sand that's been put on the coast by the Burdekin has been redistributed north. But, you know, since that time, the Burdekin has bounced around, including way down to Inkerman, and probably for about the last 2,000 years, it's been roughly, but varying around, uh, you know, in the position where it is now, up to the Anna Branch and around and about in that spot. So, over that whole time though, the general trend is for sediment to go north. But a large part of the sand that's in Cape Bowling Green was actually going north from the point where it was put there 5,000 years ago, much closer to the base of Cape Bowling Green. Uh, the reason for that history lesson is because keeping Cape Bowling Green in its present state, or the state that it was in 50 or 100 years ago, may not actually be possible, um, not because of anything that we may or may not have done, but because of the, the history of where sand has been put or not put on that coastline. And so that is a critical thing, I think, you know, because I think we could do a lot of things and we, we can always do things, but we sort of have to know what is driving the thing that we're trying to address to do those things properly. In terms of um, where you may or may not uh, sorry, put uh, mangroves, um, you know, obviously exposed on the seaward side of Cape Cleveland, now you've got you know, mangrove stumps on mangrove muds that are actually quite high, and they were put there when sea level was a little bit higher, be probably behind one of the earlier areas where the Burdekin discharged out. So there was a, a precursor to you know, Alva Spit, and they were sort of tucked in behind that at that stage when the delta looked very different from it did today. So I guess ultimately there are a lot of challenges there and I think one of the things that I would say about how we manage some of these things is we have to understand the natural variability and try and work with it. We're going to have limited resources to do things um, and we don't want to do things that, you know, a bit like Dana says, we have to work with the natural physical processes uh, rather than try and not work with them. And I, th I think that will actually mean that we have to accept that some of the things that we look at and we value are actually going to change, but they probably would have changed anyway, but they may change a lot faster with climate change. Thank you, Scott. Uh, we have a question over here. Uh, Alex, can I say one thing on that? Yeah, sure, quick. So in 1998, 1999, we said that understanding the geomorphological change of the Burdekin was a key thing. I think it was 1992, Simon Goat did his thesis identifying that the Cape Bowling Green was eroding potentially due to Burdekin Dam. I should have started at the beginning. I was taught that as an undergraduate in 1987, that the Burdekin Dam would erode Cape Bowling Green. Simon Goat did a thesis on it, said it's eroding in 1902. I wrote a report about it for the government in 1999. Uh, I, my guess is that even right now and today, it's not being looked at as part of any of these studies, <coughs> despite having been warned about it for 30 years. So. Thank you. We're going to run for about another five minutes.